Hey guys, if you like what you're seeing, be sure to click below to subscribe and share. It's not just about the photograph, it's the outdoor experience. Keep in mind everything that you need to know about photography. F-stop, shutter speed, lens selection. Nice photo, I've got beautiful light now. Oh my God. I'm your host, Doug Gardner, and your wild photo adventure starts now. This week, join me and professional wildlife photographer Jared Lloyd as we photograph one of the harshest winter environments on Earth, Yellowstone National Park. Now this park offers great wildlife photography opportunities year-round, but it's winter that is truly the most spectacular time of year to photograph its wildlife. I'm your host, Doug Gardner, and your wild photo adventure starts now. You know, one of the great things about working in places like Yellowstone National Park in the wintertime is that you get to experience how the animals survive in this brutal environment and the lifestyle that, that they have to live in order to survive this. But the more important thing is, in order for you to get out here and enjoy it, you gotta be able to survive too. So we're gonna go over a few little things that'll, that'll make you more comfortable and possibly save your life. Um, you know, we wanna start out with, with headgear. You know, headgear is where you lo lose the vast majority of your body heat. And you know, Jared, you've got the you know traditional type of uh, twill type. Uh, toboggan, beanie, toboggan. whatever you want to call it. And the inside of it actually has polar fleece wrapped around inside of it for extra warmth. Very crucial for these sort of uh, days. Yeah, and, and like this morning, we were in negative 37 degrees, very cold. We were at a higher al altitude, a little bit of wind, and that just didn't you know cut the mustard. So in those kind of conditions, you want to use a balaclava which comes up over your nose and mouth, protects this whole area, and kind of blocks out all that wind. It just simply tucks in around your jacket and comes up over your nose and mouth like this. It traps in a lot of that heat. You move on down to the jackets, and I guess we should actually start with layering. You know, that, that's the most important thing in climates like this is, is to layer your, your, your clothing not only does that allow you to shed layers if you're active, if you're doing hiking, um, in, you know, in deep snow and that kind of thing, you're going to build up a sweat. Sweat is what will get you every time. Sweat is the killer because that sweat will pull uh, body heat away from your body. So being able to shed layers as you need is, is crucial. But uh, I have actually um, three layers on. I started with a smart wool thermal underwear. Um, and then I, on top of that, I have um, a polar fleece lined pants. And then on, on the outside, my jacket and my pants are it's a waterproof shell. Yeah, um, I, I live up here in these sort of conditions, so I'm a little bit more acclimated to that. Plus, I'm kind of a, a bigger guy if you haven't noticed that yet or not. <laughs> and uh, so I have a little bit less layering on than Doug does here. For me, I've got a t-shirt on, um, but remember, not cotton. Cotton kills. That's the saying that you want to keep in your mind. But I've got a, basically a t-shirt on, then I've got a flannel on over that, and then just this jacket here. And you know, notice that both Doug and I are wearing camouflage right now. We're in Yellowstone National Park. If we wanted to be camouflaged, we would 
be wearing all white right now. Exactly. There's, this is doing absolutely nothing for us in terms of disguising us from these animals. All it is is that these type of jackets, first and foremost, are meant to be waterproof. This is a, a duck hunting jacket right here, and they're also designed for people that are sitting outdoors without moving for hours on end. And so it gives you lots of layer, or lots of room to layer, and lots of fluff for that warm air to kind of build up around your body. And they're extremely warm. Now, <clears throat> whereas Doug has kind of a more traditional hunting pants on, what I opt for are actually snowmobile pants. So in addition to having waterproof boots also, and waterproof pants, I also like to use gaiters. Uh, they simply just wrap around the bottom part of your, your pants here and the, the strap goes under the boot and a little, little hook ties into your laces. And this keeps snow from coming up your pants leg and then back down into your boots, which essentially will uh, create wet feet. So the next thing we need to talk about are boots. Boots are absolutely crucial when you're working in this sort of environment. My boots that I'm wearing are rated for negative 65. Doug's on the other hand are negative 45. Now you might think to yourself, well, it only got down to negative 37 a day. So is negative 65 a little bit of an overkill? It's actually not. In fact, my feet did get a little bit cold today, even with negative 60. And you have to understand the way that the ratings on boots work is that they're rated for activity. So if you're hiking, you're walking, you're working, then they're rated for that sort of temperature because your feet are producing heat. And what Doug and I have both found over the years in working in these sort of environments is that anywhere between 60 and 45 tend to be just about right for us. Yeah, for what we can personally stand. <laughs> exactly, yeah. I mean, you gotta be able to hike with them, you gotta yeah. be able to climb in and out yeah. of vehicles, you gotta clamber over rocks, and uh, you know, you don't wanna wear yourself out. And when you're wearing boots that are weigh, that weigh 10 pounds each, which some do, you know, you're going to uh, significantly cut down on what you're actually able to do during the day out here. If you've chosen the right boot, you should be able to get away with a thin, a thin pair of socks, whether it's polypropylene or, or another similar product that, that wicks moisture away from your foot, and then a heavier sock, like a smart wool sock or something like that, on top of it. You should have enough air space around your foot that you can trap the heat. The same thing with layers. You want to be, the, the name of the game is trapping body heat between layers. Um, and if you get them too tight, it, you're kind of defeating the purpose. That's right. You're going to be working in snow and you're going to be loosening those tripod legs and your tripods are constantly going to be in the snow so your, your hands are going to get wet if you don't have uh, some waterproof gloves. A little trick that I learned a long time ago with these type of gloves is that you can actually slip a set of hand warmers down inside of the gloves. So I have just you know the typical hand warmers that you shake to warm up sitting at the top of my hands in both of these gloves and I can just feel that heat radiating out right to my fingertips and so in the coldest of weather I can still use these. Um, and I can still feel my camera, I can work all the controls. Larger gloves that are actually designed for this sort of temperature, you can't feel your camera, your camera controls whatsoever, Breakable. and they're basically useless on you. Earlier in the week, um, I was doing some things and I could not actually use my gloves, and I've got severe frostbite and um, huge cuts, open wounds on my knuckles um, from just my hands being exposed just for a matter of minutes here. Yeah, this is serious absolutely. business, guys. I mean, you can really, you can get yourself in a, in, in a world of hurt uh, real quick if you don't prepare appropriately. I'll wear. If you spend several days in this sort of environment with that snow reflecting light back into your eyes, you can cause snow blindness, which will basically just shut down your trip. Right, absolutely. Well, I tell you, I think we're prepared. Uh, we got snow, we got cold weather, and animals on the move. I think we're ready to do it. Let's, Let's do get it. out of here. All right, man. Doug, patience, that's the name of this game, isn't it? Absolutely. You know, three days we've been trying to work this bull elk here. The first day, he's a long distance away on a hillside, tucked up at the edge of some trees. The second day, we find him down in that canyon, yep. just completely unworkable. We couldn't do anything with Nothing that. Nothing at all. Look at that, he's, he's taking his antlers and knocking the snow off of the limbs very all cool. over him. That's very cool. And then here, the third day, we're out before sunrise, you know, we wait him out, he comes up over this ridge like this, right in front of these beautiful Douglas firs. Nice I mean, this is just absolutely fantastic. You know, when you get behind the camera and the situation unfolds in front of you, 
you have to quickly make that decision. You know, lens length, where I need to be, where I need to position myself. And you know, this stuff, come, this scene right here kind of unfolded real quick. He came up out of that draw and, and now he's just coming right up over this hill. This is, this is really nice. Yeah, this is beautiful. You know, one thing that we have to be really careful about here is the fact that we have a white sky and white snow in the foreground. You think about elk, at least in my mind, you know, these are iconic animals that, that you think about when you think about the Rockies. Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, there's nothing more majestic than a big mature bull, and that's exactly what we got here. I mean, he is beautiful. You know, and we haven't seen a lot of big mature bulls this week in no, the we park. Haven't. You know, most of them, like you said, have migrated to other parts of the park. And thousands of cows. Yeah. But as far as the bulls go, it's, it's been pretty sparse this week. Yeah, so like I said, putting your time in and finding a subject, working it and tracking him down and, um, and staying with it, you know, um, it's paid off. Oh, it really has. So in this particular situation, as he emerges up out of the canyon, you actually have the opportunity for two different shots. Right now, I'm shooting a 500 millimeter lens, so I'm very tight on him. So I've got a very tight vertical shot um, as he comes up out of there. Now, as he comes up, I'm gonna to try to back up a little bit and get more of an environmental scene. Now, if you were shooting a zoom lens, like a two to 400, which is a superb large mammal lens, especially in park settings, um, you could do it right here on the spot and widen out a little bit and get more of an environment in which the animal is, is, is sitting in. One thing to keep in mind as you're making that conscious decision of whether this is going to be a portrait or an environmental portrait, keep in mind that environmental portraits sell much faster than the very tight uh, fine art type shot because environmental portraits have a lot of room. It tells more of a story. It has more uses. It can be used for inside two-page double truck spreads and magazines. It can be used for billboards or anything that, that needs text dropped in on top of it. And so your image is going to bring you more income if you decide to go that route. So it's really easy to get kind of lost behind your lens like this. You know, we've spent some time now photographing this bull elk. And we've moved around a little bit and we've worked our way down into these thick willows here. Um, the problem is, what we didn't realize at first, is that there's actually bison um, just behind this elk here. And as we sat here photographing, slowly but surely, these bison have kind of worked their way in. And we've got four of them now that are pretty close to us. And so this is one of those sort of situations that if you're not constantly aware of your surroundings, then you can very quickly find yourself in a lot of trouble. So we need to go ahead and wrap this up and move out of this situation before we get ourselves in a pretty bad, pretty bad predicament. Sounds but good. I'm going to take one last shot here. There's always that one last shot. There's always it? that one last shot. <laughs> Those guys are fast. <laughs> I tell you what, antelope, man, they are cool animals. Yeah, aren't they? they are. You know, they're actually the second fastest animal on earth. The cheetah runs about 70 miles an hour. The pronghorn antelope runs at 60 miles an hour. Really? Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, they are so graceful looking. Now, what a beautiful animal. They're real smooth and petite looking, you know, they, I mean, that light colored fur. And man, look at the way, you know, all this snow around us is acting like a gigantic reflector. Yeah. You know, so you don't have those dark shadows under their bellies like we're used to seeing, you know, in, uh, when they're in a more neutral tone setting. But uh, what, a, what a pretty animal. And with these guys, you know, they're pretty much just grazing, so you almost have to kind of wait to let them do something interesting or get near some kind of interesting background or to, you know, add compositional elements to your, to your photograph. Yeah, we've got a little little buck coming in here on the left. Pretty animal, I'll tell you what. One thing to keep in mind in these cold temperatures, you have to hold your breath when you're behind the camera because the slight bit of, of steam that comes out of your mouth or your nose, it comes right up here on the viewfinder. Instant fog. And that can mean the difference between getting a photograph or completely missing several.
and we spotted this bighorn sheep from the road. Now, he's up here on the side of the slope, and from the road, it wasn't a very good shot. We were looking straight at the slope, so it was a very flat, unappealing scene. So when you, when you have the opportunity to work your subject, try to change your angles. Now, we've talked about changing angles in the past, um, and a lot of times that's just literally moving to the right or the left. But in this instance, I want to really show the animal's environment and show the, the, the type of area that he, the terrain that he lives in. So I've climbed up the edge of this slope to try to get eye level with him. Now I'm using the slope as a compositional element. And the, the light, I've, by doing that, I've changed the light. The light's coming 45 degrees off to the side and we're getting a much more dramatic shot now. So Doug, this part of the park is what we call the Northern Range. And it's a lot different than the rest of the, uh, the National Park here, as you've seen so far. You know, we're a lot lower elevation here and you can see there's quite a bit less snow. Um, yeah, you know, it's that. kind of more of like a desert-like situation. We've got sagebrush, we've got rocks. It's very different than the deep forest in the interior. And the key thing about this area in the wintertime is because it's lower elevation, because it's exposed to the southern sky, it has less snow and it's easier for these animals to access their groceries, basically. Yeah, I know you were telling me, you know, the amount of snow in the on the upper part of the mountains you know determines how far it pushes down like the elk and the you know the rest of these animals exactly you know one thing i notice with a lot of beginner photographers is that they're very scared for some reason to move that little sensor point around inside of their viewfinder just like you have to kind of constantly check your exposure and you're constantly checking your histogram as the lighting's changing as these animals move across this hill face or this cliff face you also need to be constantly working that autofocus button you know, in a scene like this, we got a lot of this giant sage around, as you can see, and it's neutral tone, and the, the body of our bighorn sheep are neutral tone. So, um, you know, exposing, you, you, you would think that you need to expose for those neutral tones since the scene is primarily a neutral tone scene, but we still have patches of white, and as with all photography, you want to expose for those highlight areas. You know, we still have to have consideration for these white snow patches that, that these magnificent animals are, you know, are standing in and around. So uh, staying on top of your, your exposure is key here. You know, another thing that you notice here, you look at the coloration of these bighorn sheep compared to the color of the sagebrush and the rocks and the, and the dirt that's exposed here. And you see they're all pretty much the same color. Right. They're very camouflaged to this. And so photographing these sheep against this hillside like this, they just blend right in. Right. There's nothing to really make them stand out. And that's gonna be kind of the key challenge to photographing these animals this time of year in the wintertime when they're down low like this, is trying right. to figure out exactly how to make that animal jump jump out or leap out at your viewer. And so in this sort of situation, it's absolutely perfect. We're just about 90 degrees to the angle of the sun here, so we have maximum polarization yep. naturally in the sky. And so you can see this one ram that's starting to walk his way across the ridge yeah, up here. They're steady on the move. Exactly, so you look at it, suddenly we have this ram that steps up, steps up on top of these rocks, and instead of a brown background for a brown animal, we have this just beautiful cobalt blue sky yeah, behind him. <laughs> and it just it just really jumps out at us. It. So it's, it's far more interesting interesting than, you know, photographing this guy against, you know, just kind of a brown and rather blasé background that we had earlier. Yeah, separation is the key. I mean, with all photography, you know, you don't want it to blend into background. So anything that can create separation, whether that be a shallow depth of field, you know, that can help create separation. Uh, like you said, the background can do it. But, you know, making that, that subject pop out from the background is, is key. You know, when you're photographing these animals, you really want your photographs to capture the essence of these, these magnificent animals. I mean, these are the true icons of the, the you know, high Rockies. And you, you want your, your images to say something. You don't want the same old blase image that everybody else has got. Um, so a lot of times, just simply waiting on body position, you know, stay on the animal as he moves across the slope here. You know, just an animal sitting against a flat slope that doesn't, that doesn't tell a story. But wait for that big ram to step up one foot up on, onto a rock and turn and look back over his shoulder. Or he's angled away from you and he turns back and looks over his back at you or, or looks at the rest of the herd. Uh, those are the, the type of images that, that express some kind of feeling. All right, Jerry, well, I, think, I think I got some pretty good shots out of this. You, you done? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. Tell you what, they're, they're making their way, it looks like the whole herd is making their way down around this uh, the edge of this mountain. Let's, let's proceed on down here. We might find some better angles, and uh, you know who knows what we'll, we'll run into. Some deep snow here, isn't it? Yeah, man. 
Tell you what, Jerry, this is beautiful. I mean, even though we're not in the park technically anymore, this is beautiful up through here. Yeah, it really pays to learn some of the back roads around the area and get up in the hillsides up in the National Forest. Hey, we even got some mule deer right up here on this slope in front of us. That's why we're here, Doug. Wow, this is beautiful. So, Doug, after the creation of the National Park, uh, Congress realized that the political boundaries, that's Yellowstone, doesn't actually encompass the entire ecosystem. So okay. what they ended up doing was surrounding the entire national park with national forests, okay. which are all fantastic places to photograph, like we're in right now. And so, you know, you really want to get off the main road sometimes, kick it in a four-wheel drive, and cruise up into these back roads safely, obviously. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. yeah I'll tell you <laughs> but, what, in um, weather like this, it, you know, you have really got to be careful. Oh, definitely. You can drive off the road in a snow drift, and <laughs> it might be the end of you. That's right. You know, these animals, they don't, they don't know the boundaries, and that's the cool thing about this. Can you believe this? Look at this big buck. I mean, he's not a monster buck, but he is a very respectable mule deer laying down right here in front of us. Yeah, this isn't, uh, this isn't typical South Carolina whitetail behavior, is it? No, it's not. No, <laughs> around home, they're, they're trying to get away from that's it as fast right, as yeah. possible. This is, this is really that's nice. That's why we work here. You know, look at that little, uh, little button buck coming up behind me. There you go, that's a nice shot. Oh, we're getting a little bit of behavior. That's yep. what I'm talking uh, about. That's you know, an intimate moment right there, he's yeah. on the behavior. Yep. Look at that, they're interacting together. He's kind of rubbing his snout up there against the, the big buck's antlers. Very cool. Oh my gosh, dude. I'm really tight on this. You know, I'm shooting a straight 500 and I'm, I'm full animal, frame to frame. Yeah, Doug, I'm, I'm shooting with a 600 millimeter here in order to capture these tight portraits as well. But personally, I also like to carry in a shorter lens whenever is possible. And so that's why I drug in this 200 to 400 with me. And, you know, normally this is the type of lens that most people would lock down on a tripod. But as long as you're using proper long lens handholding technique, you know, you can get away with handholding something like this, especially in such good light. And so what I like to do, and really I guess is the proper way of doing this, is you take the barrel of the lens and rest it in the palm of your hand. And you just kind of bring the camera in nice and tight, lock your elbows into your sides, into your chest here, and you use your entire upper body to rotate with the animal as it moves across instead of swinging your arms around. And that gives you a pretty steady, uh, a pretty steady platform to shoot like this from. I tell you, this is a really nice scenario here. You know, I found that it seems like most beginner photographers, they really stress themselves out about photographing subjects in white snow, especially dark subjects in white snow. And, you know, and, and really it, it's, it's a simple way to, to get an exposure if you know how to do it properly. When it comes down to photographing in the snow, probably the easiest way to do it is to just simply use manual exposure. And so what I like to do is I'll switch my camera over to spot metering. I'll spot meter off of the brightest area on the snow in my composition. And since I'm shooting a Nikon, that means I'm probably going to end up adding about one full stop, two thirds to one full stop right. of compensation. Canon cameras, they have a little bit different type of metering system. You're probably going to end up closer to one and two thirds exactly. full stops, maybe even two full stops. You set your exposure that way, turn, recompose, and start shooting. And you're really not even going to have to change that exposure until the light changes considerably or otherwise you move. And one rule to go by is if you expose properly for the highlights, no matter what the scenario, whether oh, yeah. shade or full sun, you're dealing with white or bright subjects. Um, if you if your exposure is coming out so that the, the white areas is, is exposed properly and the dark areas are just going black, you know the situation is too contrasty. So you need to you know, relocate, change angle, or, or get a little more creative. Well, exactly. You know, it, today, you know, the kind of the buzzword in photography is histogram. Check your histogram. Right. That's the end all be all of your exposure. You know, we go back to the days of film and slides and it wasn't histogram, it was 18% gray. Right. You know, right. and so the problem is, is I feel that a lot of photographers don't truly understand how the exposure, you know, system inside of their camera actually works. And though we have digital technology and we have histograms to work by, we're still, we still work with a metering system that's exposing for 18 percent gray exactly. at all times and so as long as you know that that snow is technically white and not gray you know that you can meter off of the snow add light by slowing down the shutter speed or upping your iso or opening up your aperture of course right. and you can turn that gray snow into white snow like it's supposed to be exactly it's and real simple and 
that histogram, you know, people make it a lot harder than it really needs to be. But basically, you want to, you know, to adjust the exposure so that the, hist the information on the histogram is as far to the far right side as you can without touching that far right wall of it, and your exposure is going to be just right. It's real simple as long as you understand exposed to the right. right. The right side of the histogram are the lights of the bright. So rights are brights and the left is dark, and that's it. This is some beautiful light on this buck that I tell you. Really nice. And this is one of those situations that is an easy exposure. You know, just exposed to that white and he's neutral toned, so we know that he's not gonna be underexposed. That's right. Wow, this is really nice. Well, we got a bit of a drive to get out of here though, Doug, so we should probably go ahead and yeah. shoulder the tripods and haul out. I don't want to leave out. this though, but I don't want to be left here. It's, yeah, it's, you don't want to be already, wolf food either. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's already up minus eight degrees, so, uh, uh, but this is nice. <laughs> heat wave compared to this morning. I'm with you. Let's bug right, out. Let's do it. You know, one of the great things about working here in the Everglades. Yellowstone. Right. Far from the Everglades. <laughs> do something, Jay. For tan. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, how does this thing work? Uh, Jerry? <laughs> yeah, there you go. You want me to show you how to use that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Loquacious means somebody that uh, is to actually have a, uh, have a big and flowery vocabulary. Is that the same thing as diarrhea of the mouth? Yeah. Uh, take three. Four, take. I want to take this opportunity to explain to you how to get a proper exposure for neutral tone subjects in white snow. All snow is white. <laughs> Hey guys, if you like what you're seeing, be sure to click below to subscribe and share.